Hello everybody, blessing of the Lord be upon you. I am Father Serafim, Abbot of New Rachanica, as many of you know, and with the blessing of our Bishop, Longin, we are doing this series of brief, basic Bible studies. A reminder to always check the description of these videos below um, for some basic outline of what each lecture is going to be about and to um, also have, for example, the prayer for reading of the scripture. I will always post two of them, one for reading of any scripture and one for the reading of the Gospels. So tonight we are going to begin with the book of Genesis, the book of origin. In the book of Genesis, one might um, say this is one of the more um, let's say mystical or mysterious books because certain things that are written there in a very very brief way are pretty difficult to interpret for a lot of people. There are always two schools of thought as you might learn if you um, take upon yourself a deeper study of uh, the scripture the exegesis of the scripture, as they call it, on so many issues, when it comes to the commentaries, there will be two opinions. So, the first chapter, um, we're not going to read through it entirely, but the first chapter begins with God creating the heaven and the earth. All the matter, as we might call it nowadays, creating it out of nothing. This is a very important concept to keep in mind. So, <clears throat> as God created planet Earth, made it what it is right now, with the atmosphere, with the whole biosystem, if you will, in the end, um, after the six days of creation, on the sixth day, he creates a human being in his own image and likeness, as he himself said. We'll read that verse, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. A few things to keep in mind here right away. God said, let us make man. The interpretation of the Holy Fathers is, of course, that God, being the Trinity, is speaking in plural. There is a very nice uh, book written by St. Nikolai of Zica, as we call him St. Nikolai Velimirovich. The book is called Kasiana, and there are a hundred points on the Christian love. Some of these points are also explaining um, other dogmatic concepts of our faith. But one question among these hundred questions and answers that appear in the book, and the book was published here, by the way, one is, why did God even create man? Now, a lot of people wonder that question, of course, and here we are, the book of Genesis, the origin of everything, trying to figure out why did God even make people. So, the answer that St. Nikolai provided was really fantastic, and surely this was taken from other patristic sources as well, the commentaries on the scripture. God in the Trinity Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always existed. And then at one point, says St. Nikolai, the Son says to the Father, why don't we create more children for you? And the Father says, yes, why don't we create more brothers and sisters for you? And St. Nikolai calls this the pre-eternal council. So, as far as commentary on this very verse, that will be by far my favorite. 
why God said, let us make man in our image and likeness. And then God created them, male and female, he created them. In the second chapter, there's a bit of a recap, if we will, of the creation of the human being, or rather human beings, and an important verse that I will pick out here is 2 7, chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We are going to see later throughout the entire scripture and throughout the entire process of trying to figure out what are we even doing here, who are we, where are we going, this idea of God made man out of the dust of the earth, the elements of the earth. God created the earth itself and all the matter out of nothing. That's why there are prayers in which we say, thank you, Lord, for creating us out of nothing. If it wasn't for him, there would be nothing. There wouldn't just be us wondering what do we do, but there would be no us, there would be nothing. God makes the human being out of the elements of the earth. You can ask any doctor, any scientist um, that works with human anatomy and physiology, what is the human being composed of? The answer is going to be the elements of the earth, including mostly water. So, only when the Lord breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils, the man became a living soul. We could say the man became exactly what he was meant to be, what he was supposed to be. This was the beginning of God's relationship with the human being. The beginning of the journey, some might even say. And then, verse 8 and 9 in chapter 2. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Very important to keep this in mind. In the creation of everything, God provides the way for people to be fed, not just with physical food as we are fed nowadays, but to be fed with something off of this tree of life that will keep the human being alive forever. We'll see later how that is interrupted. And second, very important to distinguish, another tree God created, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like I said, there are always two opinions, two schools of thought. So, if we want to think about an actual tree growing fruit that will provide life forever, and another tree growing some kind of fruit that, when consumed by chewing and swallowing, will give one knowledge, that will be fine. And if somebody would rather think of it metaphorically, well, there's even holy fathers of the church that would say that will be okay. I'm always with a more literal school of thought, just as a disclaimer. So, <clears throat> the Lord plants the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, and he says to Adam and Eve not to eat from that tree. To eat from any other tree, whatever they want in the Garden of Eden, including, of course, the tree of life that will keep them going forever, only not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, in order to go through the very important concept of the fall of man from God, 
we're going to read through a good part of the third chapter. So, this is happening in the Garden of Eden. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, had God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. By the way, I am reading from the Old King James Version. You are welcome to read, of course, from any um, version of the Bible that you are used to, that you have in your home. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. The serpent is the devil speaking to God's people. God told us, if we touch this tree and eat its fruit, we are going to die. Immediately, the devil serves a lie and says, no, you will not. Then the devil says, the serpent, For God doth know that in the day that he eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Here is how the devil is tempting people. There is something that somebody doesn't want you to have. There is something that, if you obtain it, will move you ahead, give you an advantage. Not only a little bit of advantage, like people might think in this world, in their relationships, in their business, etc., but an absolute advantage. You will become like God himself. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. <clears throat> Adam and Eve were functioning in a certain harmony, we can say. It's not that it took a lot of convincing for Eve to force Adam to eat of the tree. They were pretty much in one accord of wanting that forbidden fruit, which would somehow, according to the devil's promise, which was a lie, make them like God. <clears throat> Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Here, Adam is admitting that something has happened, but he is not going to, he is not willing to admit all the way what it is that happened, and how he now knows that he is naked. Maybe if we used the word exposed, rather than naked, exposed in every possible um, meaning of that word, on every possible level, including spiritually, then it starts to make sense why Adam and Eve are so worried now that they are exposed. <clears throat> and he said, the Lord said, Who told you? Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Immediately shifting the blame. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Adam is blaming Eve, but note that he said, the woman that you 
gave to be with me, she convinced me to eat this. Eve is saying to God, the serpent beguiled me. Well, who created the serpent? God did. And the serpent brought the message from the devil, the voice of the devil, if you will, into the whole story. So, instead of repenting of the sin that they committed, of transgressing God's commandment, they are pushing the blame not only to each other and to the serpent, but back to God himself. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God is condemning this creature that brought the message from the devil into the world. If somebody wonders, is this creature an actual talking reptilian, able to talk like a human being? Once again, guess what? Two schools of thought. Some holy fathers would say, yes, that's exactly what it was. A very intelligent creature that could speak as we speak. And some will say, of course, this is a metaphorical incarnation, if you will, materialization of Satan in this material creation. <clears throat> then, unto the woman, the Lord said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto the dust shalt thou return. <clears throat> A lot of important concepts to keep in mind now. The Lord is pushing the people out of the Garden of Eden, where they had basically free life, everything infinite, as long as they want, as much as they want. All they had to do was, as a lot of the saints will uh, comment on the story, all they had to do was keep the fast. God told them not to touch the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because if they do, they will die. They couldn't handle it. At some point in time, they would have been able, probably, to handle it, at least in the measure that God would have allowed, and then they would have, in the inevitable process of growth in his image and likeness, they would have acquired this knowledge of good and evil as much as was possible or necessary for them to have and to know. However, they immediately took it all, they immediately had this awareness of exactly who they are and what condition they were in. And then the Lord put them out of that blessed place of eternal blessed existence, back to a certain lower level of existence in a world that was now subject to death. Again, in the commentaries and discussions about how does this work, how is this uh, fair, some might even say, well, if God had not pushed the people away from the tree of life, meaning made them mortal, 
they would have carried that evil with them forever. So, <clears throat> let's see. 324. God drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. In a spiritual sense, on a spiritual level, God blocked the path for people to come back to the tree of life in the condition that they were in. <clears throat> this is in the most, uh, in the shortest possible um, edition, the story of creation of the world, creation of human beings, how they were supposed to begin living in God's creation with the blessings that he provided. But instead, as soon as they were given one commandment, one direction, they chose to disobey it. This brings up other topics as well, other issues. Obviously, free will. Every human being has free will. God gave them free will, which is why they chose to transgress his commandment and to eat that fruit even after he told them not to. So, as a little bit of recap, God orders people to keep a temporary fast Instead of being obedient to their own benefit, they choose to be disobedient. They do not show any repentance. They are put into exile, away from the tree of life, so they will not live forever, but they will return to the dust from which they were taken. Eden is closed off, but a very important detail was up here when the Lord said to the serpent that he is cursed, the serpent, the beast is cursed, and there is enmity between the serpent and the woman, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And when the Lord says that the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head and the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. This is what the saints call Proto-Evangelion, Prvo Evangelie, or in English, the first gospel, the first good news. Immediately after the exile from the Garden of Eden, God is announcing to the people, Adam and Eve, that at some point, somebody would come from her seed, as he put it, that would crush the head of the serpent. At the same moment, at the same episode, when the Lord is pushing people away from the tree of life, he is giving them a promise that somebody is going to come who is going to overcome that whole problem. As we are going to obviously see much, much later, he is announcing the Messiah the one sent from him, the anointed one, the son of God, but obviously we'll get to that point chronologically. So, for the time being, we shall wrap this up for tonight. We are going to conclude every one of these um, episodes with question and answer. Again, a reminder, the, the first source for questions and answers on any scriptural topic is your parish priest. Believe me, they will be happy to talk about the Holy Scripture instead of some other things that they often have to talk about. But for tonight, there is one question that appears so often, um, especially among our bright children in the camp. When we read the story from the children's Bible, in the children's format about Adam and Eve, and they fell away from God, there's always the question, what if they hadn't sinned? 
What if they had listened? Now, from the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise, says the Bible. It's an excellent question from their clear little minds. And the answer really can be gigantic. We are not going to go into too many details and, and make it too broad. But, <clears throat> number one, God knew that people would transgress his commandment. In the interpretation of the Holy Fathers, in the commentary in the scripture, there is uh, an agreement on this topic. There is no two schools of thought. God knew that when he created people in his own image and likeness, with free will, he knew that he was going to have to come into this creation where we are, and, to put it simply, save us from ourselves. So, <clears throat> the question of what if they hadn't sinned is a fantastic one to consider. There was a really excellent bishop of our church, Bishop Danilo Kristic. Somebody asked him that question. More precisely, it was, um, if Adam and Eve had never transgressed, if we all lived in the Garden of Eden, if we never faced death, if we were never subject to death, then would the Lord have done what he did and how? And would we be taking communion the way we do or how? The answer was very cute from the late Bishop Danilo. And he said we will be living there in total blessedness and... He would have been incarnate as a human being because he would want to be with us, we like him and he like us. It didn't have to be for this horrible reason so that he himself would face death as we face death now. And then he says, and his mother would hold him in her arms and we would just come up and touch his little feet and that would be enough of a communion for us. So... Human nature is what it is. Adam and Eve transgressed the law. And as I like to answer when the children ask, especially the older ones, what if they hadn't transgressed? Well, if they hadn't, somebody would have. You or I. If not you, definitely me. Somebody would have transgressed God's law. Somebody would have brought it there. To the situation where we would have to face death as the ultimate resolution and the ultimate possibility of being separated from evil. Did God create evil? No. God created free will. So, brothers and sisters, that will be it for tonight. We are going to try to post two or three of these 25 minute studies per week and we will see you next time. God bless all of you.